What's cracking guys? In this video I'll be covering two uh, very interesting older seminal papers. Uh, one of them being uh, this one that introduces a method called New Revolution of Augmenting Topologies or NEAT for short. So you may know it by the, by the acronym NEAT. And if you've ever watched some of those uh, neural network learns to play a game uh, types of videos on YouTube, such as uh, these two are very, very popular. Uh, so the fun fact is both of these um, videos used uh, the NEAT uh, algorithm that was introduced in this paper to uh, train a neural network uh, to play the snake game or to play the Super Mario uh, in this video here. Uh, the second video I'm gonna, uh, the second paper I'm gonna cover is the uh, compositional pattern producing networks uh, or CPPNs for short and the reason I'm so excited about this paper and that I've discovered it quite recently is that well I've been personally thinking about um, like approaching uh, machine learning from various different perspectives one of those being genetics uh, the other one being neuroscience and as you may know like there's a lot of people um, like doing genetics uh, as their as their primary job uh, and maybe then additionally learning machine learning or deep learning and infusing those two fields together and that's super exciting but like if genetics is step one and neuroscience i.e adult human brains are like step three then like for whatever reason we are missing out on this whole step in between where after the fertilization after you have the sperm cell uh fertilizing the egg cell and you get the zygote so then this whole process of development whereby from this single cell called zygote you end up with a like a adult I mean, baby uh, brain, baby human brain, we, we kind of don't know what's going on there. And in my opinion, just understanding uh, that whole procedure can help us uh, design better architectures. So that's at least my intuition. So basically, instead of uh, crafting neural architectures, why not understand the actual process, a biological process that leads to uh, to like such a complex architectures as, as the human brain and then train uh, that, that architecture. So that's the rough idea. The CPPM paper um, is one of the models of this development process. So covering this, this number two here uh, on, on this drawing and I'll be covering it after NEAT. So before that, let's, let's just uh, dig into NEAT and understand how this uh, uh, like optimization method works. Okay, so let's start here. Uh, the goal of fixed topology neuroevolution is to optimize the connection weights that determine the functionality of a network. And that's something we are, we are very familiar with. We usually have a fixed architecture, a fixed, fixed topology, and we try and, and, and we try and tune the, the, the weights. Now they say here, the basic question, however, remains, can evolving topologies along with weights provide an advantage over evolving weights on a fixed topology? So again, let me just kind of reiterate here. Uh, usually what you end up with in machine learning is at least in deep learning. So if you have a neural network, let me just kind of draw for simplicity's sake, a simple NLP model, a single hidden layer. So it's gonna be connected something like this. So you have a connection going from uh, input neurons to output neurons, so something like this. And now what you usually uh, end up doing is you have, depending on your task, you define a loss function and then you apply some gradient based optimization method. Usually Adam is very popular or just a plain old SGD, et cetera, et cetera. So what this uh, like paper instead proposes is why not learn, I mean learn, why not discover architectures and then um, tune them along the way as well. So instead, uh, what it does is it starts with the simplest possible neural networks where depending on the, on the task, obviously you'll have, for example, let's say we have a, such a task where the input is a scalar and the output is a scalar. In that case, it will start with as simple neural networks as this one, where you have a, just a single connection directly from the input output. There is some weight here and that's, that's it, very simple. Uh, and then what they do is basically they ha have a population of these uh, neural networks and they'll basically be evolving them. They'll be mutating them. They'll be discovering new architectures, tuning the parameters, and uh, in, by doing that, solving the task. So that's a very rough idea behind NEAT. Now let's let's uh, dig into a bit more details. So first, let's let's kind of open it up with, with some questions. Um, they say here, so evolving structure incrementally presents several technical challenges. First, 
Is there a genetic representation that allows disparate topologies to cross over in a meaningful way? Because you can imagine if you have very different topologies, like for example, let's take this one and let's take this super simple one, it's not quite clear how do you go about uh, doing cross mating between uh, these two architectures? How do you uh, mix up the genes uh, behind these architectures? And if the terminology is not clear enough now, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a second, but like just have some rough uh, mental map for now. Uh, the second question is how can topological innovation that needs a few generations to be optimized be protected so that it does not disappear from the population uh, prematurely? So what they say here is the following. So imagine you have again a set a population of neural networks and I'm going to just know them uh, by these uh, simple rectangles just for abstraction sake for, for simplicity sake. So let's say we have like three neural networks and let's say you mutate one of these. So these are just MLPs. So this is like uh, neural network one, two, three. And let's say you mutate this one by adding additional node here. Okay. And now what will happen is if you were to continue uh, comparing uh, this uh, novel, uh, like this mutated neural network with the uh, networks two and three, it would be a suboptimal probably because uh, initially this is just randomly initialized or something and then it cannot compete. And so what they do, how NEED solves this is they basically do this speciation process whereby they group similar networks together and then they form niches and then these networks compare uh, between each other, but they don't compare with other uh, global, like arbitrary network from, from the whole population. So that will be the, the solution that NEAT introduces to cope with this problem. So basically speciation. Uh, the third question is, how can topologies be minimized throughout evolution without the need for a specially contrived fitness function that measures complexity? And I kind of hinted at the solution already here. And the solution is to start with the simplest networks possible and then gradually keep adding the complexity. And because they, the, the optimization procedure of NEAT has this, this bias, this, this inherent bias, uh, that's why it's going to be looking for simpler architectures uh, in the first place. And this uh, aligns very neatly with the, with the principle of the OCAMS razor. Uh, whereby the, the simpler, the simplest hypothesis, the simplest model um, that performs uh, like good enough is probably the best one. Okay, um, and the first question will be solved by these historical markings, but we're gonna get to, uh, at that point in a couple of minutes. Okay, let me first show you how they represent the networks in the background, because if you're not familiar with genetic algorithms, this all, all of this may be a bit um, like weird. Uh, and so because of that, let me just start here. Uh, so what they do is for every neural network in the population of neural networks, they keep up, they keep this genome in the background. So also known as genotype and each genotype corresponds one to, to uh, one to one to the, to the phenotype corresponding phenotype. So this genotype basically determines this, this phenotype, this neural network here. And this is just a terminology from genetics. Um, so phenotype basically means uh, any observable trait. For example, in humans, that may be like the eye color, that may be like, may be like blood type, whatnot. And there is some gene that's coding up for that particular phenotype, for that observable trait. So that's the terminology they are taking here because uh, this, is, this whole optimization field is roughly uh, loosely inspired by the genetics and, and um, thus the terminology. Okay, so you can see here, they have two different lists of, of uh, like uh, genes. First is the node genes. So we have node one through node five, corresponding to these nodes here, one through five. And you can see there are different types of nodes. So some of these are sensor nodes, which means input nodes. Some of these are output nodes, like node four here. And then we have the hidden nodes, the node five here. Uh, more interestingly, they have these connections genes, and you can see how each of these squares uh, basically describes uh, these connections. So let's take this one, for example. So you can see here, uh, we have uh, one, let me just change the color to red here. So we have one uh, as the input and then four as the output. So that basically specifies this particular connection here. 
you can see the weight is uh, 0 0.7 you can see that it's enabled uh, I'm gonna tell you what that is in a, in a minute and we have this innovation number also known as this historical marker which is uh, a very important part of, of this whole algorithm and I'll, I'll get into a bit more details a bit later uh, okay, so this enable thing, so let me contrast that with disabled. Uh, so if we have this connection between two and four, and if you take a look, there is no connection between two and four because it's disabled. And again, this uh, terminology comes from the genetics. Uh, genes can be expressed or not expressed. If a gene is not expressed, then basically you don't have the associated phenotype. So for example, uh, you don't want to, so for example, if you have, you have obviously different cell types in your body, you have like skin cells, you have like muscle cells, you have neur neurons or neural cells. And obviously a, a muscle cell doesn't need a certain proteins that, that, the neuro, that the neural cell needs. And thus those genes are not expressed in that particular cell. So that's the rough um, like, yeah, background uh, in genetics uh, behind all of this terminology. So that's, that's roughly it. So now that we have this list, this list, uh, this genotype uh, completely specifies a particular network. And then you can kind of mutate these and we'll get to that in a second. Um, okay, so before that, let me just uh, first mention this problem of competing conventions. So let me tell you what this is and why should we care. Um, you can see two neural networks here on the left and the right. And basically these two neural networks have the same function. Uh, and the reason is, so you can see here, uh, basically C is the same as C here, Bs are, are the same nodes and As are the same node, they're just permuted. And because we have a sum function here, because we, as you know how these neurons work, you have a summation here, which is permutation invariant, which means we don't really care about the order of these nodes. And because of that, the function will be the same. And you can just kind of think about it and you'll see that uh, what I just said makes sense. So it doesn't matter, like no matter the permutation, you'll, you'll end up with the same functionality in the neural network. Now, why this is problematic for genetic algorithms is the following. So if you wanna cross these two genomes, so let's say we have genome A, B, and C, and we have C, B, and A, uh, if you were to do a pointwise mutation, so that means you'll take a certain gene from, let, let's say we have A, B, C, and we take, uh, instead of C, we take the, the gene A, we end up with A, B, and A. If we had a point mutation that's happening in this genome, so if this one was the dominant uh, genome, and we were to mutate A into C by randomly taking the gene from this genome instead, you, we end up with CBC. Now why this is bad is because as you may notice here, we just lost one third of the information in, from, the, from, the, from the original uh, genotypes. And that's obviously undesirable. So we want to be able to recognize and match uh, corresponding genes in, because we don't want to lose them. And that's where these historical markings come into play. And we'll get to those in a minute. Um, so let me just kind of reiterate. Uh, when one of these permutations crosses over with another, critical information is likely to be lost. For example, crossing ABC and CBA can result in CBC, a representation that has lost one third of the information that both of the parents had. Okay, so NEAT basically solves this problem by doing this historical um, markings uh, stuff. Okay, let's continue here and let me show you the mutation procedure. And then we're gonna slowly build up the whole holistic picture of how this neat algorithm works. So I'm kind of going bottom up, which is a contrary to my usual approach of going top to bottom. But like in this particular paper, I guess that makes some sense. Uh, there are two types of mutations we can we can imagine here. One is uh, adding like a connection and the other one is adding a node. So Let's focus on the first one, adding connection. You can see here that we add this connection between neurons three, between nodes uh, three and five. And you can see that we added, so, so starting from this genotype here, uh, after we added the connection between three and five with the historical marking seven or innovation number as it's also called. So we end up with this novel genome here. Uh, we have the other um, mutation happening here here uh, we add the node. So you can see here we add node six, which basically um, like disables this previous connection and adds two novel connections. And that's why we have, so between three and four, this one will be disabled. And you can see that we added from three to six. So we have this one and we have from six to four. So we added two novel connections and we have the novel uh, innovation numbers here. 
So this is uh, the way in which um, basically uh, NEAT uh, adds the additional complexity to the current population. So again, retreating the top number in each genome is the innovation number of that gene. The innovation numbers are historical markers that identify the original historical ancestor of each gene. New genes are assigned new increasingly higher numbers. In case another instance of a neural network adds the exact same connection, let's say uh, this connection three to five, uh, then they would reuse the, the, this uh, innovation number seven for that particular instance as well. So there, there would not be like a blow up, artificial blow up of these, of these historical markings and that's why they, they work. Okay, so that's some background. Now let's dig a bit deeper. Um, so they say here, I'm just gonna skip this part because we already covered it. So in the future, whenever these genomes meet, the offspring will inherit the same innovation numbers on each gene. Innovation numbers are never changed. Okay, they are never changed. Thus, the historical origin of every gene in the system is known throughout evolution. Okay, so when crossing over, the genes in both genomes with the same innovation numbers are lined up. So we line them up, we're gonna see an image in a second, and these genes are called matching genes. So we have the matching genes. Genes that do not match are either disjoint or excess, depending on whether they occur within or outside the range of other parents' innovation numbers. In composing the offspring, genes are randomly chosen from either parent and matching genes, whereas all excess or disjoint genes are always included from the more fit parent. So that's an important um, detail here. Okay. So let's see all of that pictorially here. Uh, let's assume we have two different topologies uh, from the same population, from the same subpopulation, same species if you want, although they sometimes do interspecies uh, and intraspecies. They do both intra and interspecies uh, uh, crossing. Uh, but here, so you can see two genomes and what they do, let me just kind of zoom in a bit. They align these two genomes uh, according to these uh, like uh, innovation numbers. So you, you can see one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, all of these are aligned. And then you have the disjoint ones because six and seven from this one does not exist in this genotype. And then we have eight being disjoint. And finally we have this excess genes because they are out of the range of the parent one. Okay, so now how the uh, crossing works is you basically randomly take gene from either parent one or parent two uh, when it comes to these matched genes. So you can see here, this is kind of gray, which means we took that one from the parent one. Then this is, uh, okay, darker gray, which is maybe from either of the parents. And this is uh, whitish, which means we took it from here. Then we took it from here. And finally, we took it from here. So that means we are randomly taking genes from, from either parents. Uh, finally, we take the, the genes from the more fit parent and because in this particular case, they kind of have equal fitness, both of these, they, they kind of end up taking all of the genes and we end up with the offspring genotype here and you can see the corresponding uh, phenotype exactly here. Okay, so that's cool. Now, we can slowly start and build up the whole picture. Uh, let me first read a couple more sentences and then I'm gonna uh, like kind of draw a diagram explaining the whole, the, the, the big picture. Okay, so uh, again, retreating in this case, equal fitnesses are assumed, so the disjoint and excess genes are also inherited randomly. Uh, so the reason I kind of highlighted this is to show that one of the, the cons of this uh, approach is that it's super complicated compared to gradient-based methods such as SGD, where it's quite straightforward and uh, there is not a lot of hyperparameters. Whereas here in need, there is a lot of things you have to kind of tune, the population size, how to speciate, how to set the thresholds. We'll see that in a second, but it's, there's a much, much more details to, to, to think about compared to gradient-based optimizations. So, uh, for example, the disabled genes may become enabled again in future generations. So that means some of these may be randomly enabled again. Uh, also, there's a preset chance that an inherited gene is disabled if it is disabled in either parent. So that's another detail to think about. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, these mutations will create suboptimal um, uh, neural networks uh, after the, the actual mutation happens and before the optimization of that neural network happens, it's, there's gonna be a suboptimal architecture. So how do we make sure that the innovations survive? And the answer is here. Um, 
by adding new genes to the population and sensibly mating genomes representing different structures, the systems can form a population of diverse topologies. However, it turns out that such a population on its own cannot maintain topological innovation. And that's quite important uh, to maintain. Uh, because smaller structures optimize faster than larger structures and adding nodes and connections usually in initially decreases the fitness of the network, recently augmented structures have little hope of surviving more than one generation even though the innovations they represent may be crucial towards solving the task in the long run. The solution is to protect innovation by speciating the population as explained in the next section. And this is the most important part of the paper, probably. I mean, it's one of the most important details. So let's uh, dig a bit deeper. So let's see how they define, how do they discriminate between, how do they s separate a special neural, a new neural network, a new offspring into, into a species? How do they assign a species to that particular uh, neural network? And we can see it here. So the number of excess and disjoint genes between a pair of genomes is a natural measure of their compatibility distance. The more disjoint two genomes are, the less evolutionary history they share, and thus the less compatible they are. Therefore, we can measure the compatibility distance delta of different structures in NEAT as a simple linear combination of the number of excess and disjoint genes, as well as the average weight differences of matching genes, including disabled genes. So you can see a simpler, a very simple way to um, determine how different, how, in, how incompatible to or compatible to uh, genotypes are. So you can see the more of of, of excess genes we have between two genotypes and or the more uh, dis disjoint genes we have or even if we have matching um, like genes if the the actual weights of those connections are quite different then depending on C3 uh, and this uh, variable here this delta can explode so once we have this, once we have this way of uh, measuring compatibility, we can just, they, they just set a threshold. So the distance measure uh, delta allows us to speciate using a compatibility threshold delta t. Uh, and that's how you basically sp uh, speciate. So continuing on, a given genome G in the current generation is placed in the first species in which G is compatible with the representative genome of that species. If G is not compatible with any existing species, a new species is created with G as its representative. Okay, now is a good time to draw some diagram and explain what's going on here. So imagine we have multiple subpopulations. So let's imagine we have multiple species. So here is a species one, then we have some a bit bigger species, we have another species here. And so what happens is the following. Now, these are the most, like these are the fittest individuals from the last generation. And I'm gonna explain how do we determine fitness and how do we prune based on fitness a bit later. But for now, just, just assume all of these subpopulations are left with the fittest individuals. Now what you do is you do some, some uh, basically uh, crossing. So you'll take uh, two parents here and you cross those two and you end up with another uh, with the offspring. And so this offspring now needs to be compared with representative uh, genomes in order to determine which species it belongs to. So even though it originates from this species, it now, because of these mutations, uh, because of the crossing of the genes from the parents, it may end up being a different species altogether, which does not make a lot of sense when it comes to dis like discussing, I guess, biological creatures. Uh, at, at, at least not the vertebrates, but but yeah. Uh, so let me denote that like this. So let's let me just do this. So basically, what I do is you randomly pick a genotype from this population, and that's going to be G. And you do the same thing here. Just randomly pick one, and then you do the same thing here. And for every single subpopulation. And now what you do is the following. So you take the the the, the freshly uh, created offspring here, and you calculate the uh, compatibility uh, measure. So this thing here. So you can basically, you'll basically uh, end up with a couple of numbers. So you'll have some some delta here. You'll have, and you'll you'll see whether this delta is below the threshold. If it's below the threshold, that means that we need to assign this particular uh, offspring to this species. So what they do, they have some canonical ordering of these subpopulations. So that means 
maybe uh, maybe this one's gonna be like subpopulation one, then two, then three. And the first subpopulation where the compatibility is lower than the threshold, they just cannot allocate, they just can assign that offspring to that subspecies. So if, for example, these two were not compatible, if this G, the representative genome from this subpopulation was not um, compatible with the offspring, then we would continue with uh, with the uh, representative G from the second subpopulation, which is uh, in this particular case, uh, the same species from which this offspring uh, originates from. So now if the compatibility was uh, lower than threshold, we would kind of assign again the offspring to this uh, subpopulation. So that's the, that's the rough idea. So after this crossing happens, uh, I guess what happens next is uh, just some random mutations, and then they, they assert the fitness. Uh, of all of the individuals, uh, of individual genotypes, uh, genomes in, in, in the whole population. Let's see how the fitness is determined. So fitness is um, basically depends on the particular task at hand. Uh, so depends what you're trying to solve with NEAT. Uh, so fitness will be very, very domain specific, basically. Uh, the important detail is that they use something called explicit fitness sharing, which means they do this. And that means that, so not only do you care about the particular individual, you also care how big is the species that that individual belongs to. And that's denoted uh, like algebraically uh, by this formula. So basically a summation from one to n, through n, uh, where n is the, 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 the whole population size, so including all of the species. And then we have this sh function, which is basically set to one uh, when the this compatibility threshold is below, below the, uh, this compatibility measure is below the threshold, which basically means, hey, uh, this is gonna be the, the, the size of the species that this individual belongs to. So that's a, a long, long story short. So because of that, even if you have very, very fit individuals, if the species it belongs to is very big, uh, the this adapted, I think it's adjusted fitness is gonna be lower. So that means some other less fit individuals from smaller subpopulations have the chance of surviving uh, to the next generation. Um, let me just read you a couple of more sentences here. So they say every species is assigned a potentially different number of offspring in proportion to the sum of adjusted fitnesses of its member organisms. Species then reproduce by first eliminating the lowest performing members from the population. The entire population is then replaced by the offspring of the remaining organisms in each species. Okay, let me recap what I think is going on here. So the, un the bad thing about the paper is that they don't have like a, like a, a pseudo algorithm specifying the steps in the exact order. So I kind of have to infer what's going on uh, without digging into the actual software packages, which are, as I said, quite complex compared to just your regular uh, back back uh, gradient based uh, optimizations. Uh, so. As I said, let's let's assume we have these subpopulations here, and then we determine the fitness of each of the individuals, uh, and then uh, basically we're going to prune the less fit individuals in each of these subpopulations. So we'll end up with some subsets of each of these subpopulations. Okay, and now depending on the size of the, of those like subsets, uh, each of these species will have uh, a certain number of, of offsprings they can generate. So that means now we'll take the parents, uh, we'll do the crossing, we'll, we'll have an offspring, and then we'll just kind of uh, assign it to a species depending on the, as I previously discussed, on, the, on this compatibility measure. And we rinse and repeat for all of the subpopulations that same algorithm. Um, after we do that, I guess what happens is inside of the, uh, before you start evaluating them and trying to figure out the fitness of these novel uh, uh, individuals, you do some mutations, uh, so adding connections, adding notes, and then only then do you evaluate the fitness. And then the circle repeats, you prune out the, 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 the weakest individuals, the ones with the lowest fitness uh, value, and rinse and repeat, and rinse and, and then you rinse and repeat. Okay, um, final detail worth mentioning is that, so as discussed in section 2.4, blah, 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 so this just means um, topology and weight evolution artificial neural network. So basically, 
evolving both the topology and the weights and not just the weights as we are used to. Uh, so these twins, if that's the way you pronounce this, typically start with an initial population of random topologies in order to introduce diversity from the outset. So that's how these other approaches do it. In contrast, need biases the search towards minimal dimensional spaces by starting out with a uniform population of networks with zero hidden nodes. And we saw that in the beginning of the video, but I thought worth mentioning that. Uh, okay, so that's pretty much it. That's neat. Uh, they then showed some results on a couple of tasks. Uh, one of those tasks is this XOR, so your, your logical gate uh, using all over computer science. And they showed that um, they can basically find a topology that can perform the XOR function. Uh, for that, you need to have at least one hidden node. And you can see here, so basically this is the initial individual of the, of the population. And then after uh, applying NEAT, uh, they end up with this phenotype with this individual. Uh, they can solve the um, uh, XOR uh, problem. You can see it had to add some novel nodes. You can see a novel node here, you can see uh, novel connections here, and um, basically the weights, which you can see on this, on this uh, diagram, are also changed so that this performs the XOR function. Okay, so hopefully you like the idea behind the neat paper. Um, I think it's very cool uh, because it's inspired by evolution and it has this progressive building of uh, build up of complexity and you're trying to find the topologies you're trying to at the same time tweak those weights and find the simplest um, individual that can solve the task that you care about. Uh, now the, the con side about this whole approach as you can see it's quite intricate. There's a lot of details you need to care about and all of that makes it a bit less attractive. And since this paper was published in 2002, we, we haven't seen, we really haven't seen uh, the push towards uh, this research direction. But nonetheless, I think it's a very valuable uh, like uh, idea to keep in your mind. Okay, next up, let me walk you through the compositional pattern producing networks. Okay, so on to compositional pattern producing networks, um, a novel abstraction of development paper. Uh, and before we dig into CPPNs uh, deeper, uh, let me give you another example of a very popular uh, like model of development with which you may be familiar with already, and that's the cellular automata models. So let me open up this very cool distilled pub, uh, and let me just kind of slow this down so that you can see what's going on. So you can see here that through local interactions, so each of the cell is communicating only with the neighboring cells. And via a couple of simple rules, and in this case, the rules are learned, and hence this is called neural cellular automata, uh, you can see that this phenotype, this, this, this body plan, this morphology, uh, albeit a 2D one, uh, is built up. And this could easily be generalizable to 3D uh, space and thus to, uh, like, yeah, to the space where we live in. And we could be building like real 3D bodies. Uh, using cellular automata. So this is a model of, of, uh, of development as well. So you can see, you can imagine starting from a zygote, from a single cell, and then through some type of communication, lo local communication that's very important, you end up with this particular morphology. So now what CPPNs show is that you don't need to uh, have this uh, local communication going on and uh, temporal unfolding, and that's that, that, that's just uh, like a consequence of, of 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 the fact that we live in a physical world with physics, where the laws of physics uh, are are at play, and this constrains uh, the developmental process to uh, do it like this. So let me now go back to, to CPPNs and let's see how they actually approach this. So let's let's start by reading the abstract a little bit. Uh, natural DNA can encode complexity on an enormous scale. Researchers are attempting to achieve the same representational efficiency in computers by implementing developmental encodings, i.e. encodings that map the genotype to the phenotype through a process of growth from a small starting point to a mature form. A major challenge in this effort is to find the right level of abstraction of biological development to capture its essential properties without introducing unnecessary inefficiencies. Okay, so the rest of the paper will show how they found a different model, how Kenneth Stanley found a different model uh, to uh, for this developmental process. Um, so 
basically the main contribution of the paper is to establish that CPPNs are a legitimate abstraction of natural developmental encoding, which may not be super obvious uh, on the first glance uh, of this paper. So let's start um, here. So what, uh, like, the example here shows that you can have uh, basically this phenotype uh, being generated by this uh, function f instead of having so basically instead of having uh, local interactions instead of having this temporal unfolding to get the final 2D morphology and in this case the morphology is just a triangle so this is not like a like a biological uh, like morphology but nonetheless you can just kind of abstract it away um, and let's deal with mathematical objects in 2D space so it's the same thing so f is a developmental model of this of this uh, triangle uh, if you will okay so so basically they say here that um, a developmental chronology is only one way of producing a particular constellation of particles. It follows that encoding and unfolding process may be unnecessary to produce comp complex phenotypes because a functional description could alternatively have been evolved. Such description would not necessitate a long unfolding chain of interactions and uh, productions. So the reasoning is why go through why simulate every single intermediate step with what when what we care about is the actual uh, like phenotype and if you could catch capture the whole uh, development inside of a function why not do just that so they state here that so looking at this diagram here so this observation implies that any phenotype produced through a temporal progression is also possible to represent through a functional description so in fact this paper from i think 1989 showed that any function can be approximated by a neural network with two hidden layers so that's the universal approximation theorem and uh, the more neurons in the network, so the wider the network, uh, the more accurate the approximation can be. Thus, any morphology when viewed as a distribution of particles in space is possible to represent as a function without the notion of time. So that's the, 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 the thing they're trying to kind of skip over here. Uh, just kind of understanding that that's a f more of a physical constraint than something we, we need to care about when we're trying to develop mathematical models such as this one. Um, okay, let's let's see this sentence. A significant function at early stage of development in natural embryogeny is to define a coordinate frame, i.e. a set of virtual coordinate axes upon which future stages of development will be based. Uh, the simplest and most basic of these coordinate frames are the main axes of the body, which are defined at the very beginning of development inside the egg itself. These axes include the anterior posterior axis, i.e. head to feet, and the dorsal ventral, i.e. back to front. So what are what they are basically saying here is the following. So so the gist of this is that during the development we have to somehow form these intricate patterns uh, and those are usually just chemical gradients. And if you, if, you, if you manage to form those chemical gradients, then the cells, then each cell, depending on where it is located in, depend, in, this, in, this, in this chemical gradient map, will know what to do. So we'll know what exactly to do depending on, the, on, the, on that scalar of the, of the chemical gradient. So if you are able to capture the pattern of this chemical gradient without even having the local interactions or the temporal unfolding, uh, then we can capture the, the, the development itself. And you can see that because of this left to right gradient, which is in the form of a Gaussian function, uh, this this if uh, this basically uh, implies that we'll have we'll end up with a bilateral symmetry and you can see that this fly here has a symmetry bilateral symmetry so if i were to uh, draw a vertical axis through this fly here you can notice that we have a symmetry here you can just flip it and, and nothing would change the underlying structure which is in this case the, the the fly the 2d image of a fly would not change and similarly uh, there is a gradient along this anterior posterior uh, axis and um, different patterns along on, along those those um, along the axis produce different cells. So basically, you can ignore all of this, and you can imagine. So you can ignore all of this, and you can imagine we have a certain uh, like. Let me just draw this. So we have a certain two uh, D spatial pattern here. So it will be hard to draw, but you can imagine going from so around this axis here. It's going to be quite symmetric. 
left and right and that's so basically this 2d spatial signal is gonna directly encode those chemical gradients and that's gonna uh, basically allow us to 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 form this 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 morphology here and that means we can ignore, we can just focus on trying to generate these uh, intricate 2D spatial patterns. Okay, so now let's see how do we generate these uh, 2D spatial signals which are going to loosely represent these chemical gradients and that's gonna be a blueprint for how to generate the morphology uh, or like the body of, 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 of some biological uh, organism or, or whatnot. So because we're trying to, remember, we're trying to build a developmental model uh, for biological uh, organisms. So, um, so here is one way we could be composing uh, functions. So here we have a symmetric function. Here we have a peri periodic function. You can see we can uh, generate arbitrary patterns by doing this. They mentioned here that coordinate frames created through a developmental process interact with each other to produce complex patterns with regularities. In the same way, functionally represented frames can be composed to create complex regularities. So in this way, and this has been mentioned over and over again throughout the paper, so the composition, the function composition replaces local interactions, okay? So instead of having some, some local in cellular automata-like uh, uh, communication, we can just compose the, 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 the various functions to, to end up with the, these 2D spatial signals we, uh, we care about. I mean, I'm saying 2D, but those could be 3D or, or even 4D, as we'll later see, uh, and it's just a pattern we're trying to, to, to generate. So here is the, the, how CPPNs look like, and they say that the main idea is that the order in which functions are composited is an abstraction for the chronology of events over the course of development, without the need for simulating such events locally. So in a way, a uh, signal flowing from, from here to here uh, is is an abstraction for the chronology of time. So even though we don't have any notion of time in this network per se, uh, we are kind of uh, capturing the time and all of these local interactions by doing this functional compositing. Uh, so starting from x and y, which are just the coordinate coordinates of your of your Cartesian plane, we can generate the output, the phenotype. Uh, by, by, by composing functions. And here, uh, compared to your regular artificial neural networks, what CPPNs do is instead of like just using ReLU or sigmoid for the activation function, they use arbitrary uh, like functions which are which have some nice properties. So it's either like a Gaussian or some symmetric function or like identity function or a periodic function, etc, etc. So this is what, how CPPNs look like. Okay. Um, they mentioned here that providing the initial coordinate axis as inputs to the graph is what allows local interaction to be eliminated. In physical space, there are no intrinsic coordinates that an individual cell can access to determine its location and hence its identity. Therefore, local interaction becomes a way of asking, where am I? Uh, that is, through the collective negotiation of adjacent cells that interact with each other, it is possible to derive a coordinate frame. However, by composing functions that take as arguments an absolute frame of reference, the need for such negotiation is eliminated and all identities and relative locations can be determined completely independently. So basically what they said here is we, we can kind of feed these absolute coordinates uh, into our CPPN to generate this, this output pattern. Uh, and instead, you can imagine the difficulty that a cell has, like it needs to figure out where it is based on the local communication with the, with the neighboring uh, cells. And this, uh, this, this CPPN model basically um, replaces, um, eliminates the need for, for that type of communication to happen. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of similarity between uh, like neural networks, your regular neural networks and CPPNs. And they say here, interesting, a, a graph of such compositions is very similar to an artificial neural network with arbitrary topology. The only difference between the two is that artificial neural networks generally use sigmoid functions and sometimes Gaussians or ReLUs or whatnot as activation functions in each node. Uh, whereas the function composition graph may use any of a variety of canonical functions at each node, as I previously mentioned.
They then say that the analogy between a function composition graph and uh, a neural network is so strong, uh, in fact, that it is tempting to equate the two. However, while from an external objective standpoint, they are closely related, so from the mathematical standpoint, I guess, uh, using the term artificial neural network would be misleading in the context of this discussion because uh, neural networks were so named in order to establish a metaphor with a different biological phenomena and uh, that's the brain and the terminology should avoid making the implication that biological thinking brains are in fact the same as developing embryos. Now this is kind of loose because in one of their follow-up papers in one of uh, Kenneth Stanley's follow-up papers called a uh, hyper -neat, uh, he shows that you can basically use CPPNs to model neural networks um, by just uh, modeling for the uh, spatial signals, you can map that to a neural network. So which means that in effect, this can be a model of, 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 of a brain as well. So it, these are very abstract objects. CPPNs are very abstract and they can capture arbitrary spatial patterns, which can be mapped to various things. So they can be mapped to like chemical gradients fields, which then can um, be used as a guide for, uh, for formulating a morphology, like the body of, of an organism, or it can be just a, like a plan for how to construct, construct the, the, the actual brain, the architecture, the design of a, of a, of a neural network. Okay, so let me recap what, what we've seen so far. It's a bit harder to follow along because there is a lot of text and not that many images. So yeah, stick with me. Uh, basically, the idea is the following. So if you want to produce a certain morph morphology, be it a 2D body, like in this case, or a 3D body, um, all you wanna do is be able to specify uh, arbitrarily complex spatial signals. So that means you want to have certain properties like you want to be able for your, your system to generate symmetric patterns, you want to be able to uh, generate uh, imperfect symmetry, you want to be able to um, basically uh, model uh, repetitiveness, etc, uh, etc. Et and um, once you have that spatial signal, uh, you can imagine, you can, you can basically treat that as, a, as an abstraction for actual physical processes such as chemical gradients which a cell uses to uh, communicate and build up the body. So if you can get to the spatial signal, then you're basically, you've solved the task and you, you, you've successfully modeled the developmental process. And so how we can do that, uh, that's what the CPN paper shows, is by just composing these arbitrary um, not arbitrary, these special functions such as Gaussians, symmetric functions, periodic functions, uh, etc. And we can generate those, those patterns. Uh, by doing this, we basically skip through the whole local communication, temporal unfolding thingies that are going on, and we just end up with a final plan, with a final map uh, that's eventually going to build up the phenotype. Okay, so now for the fun part. Um, let me show you what I've done. They basically used, and that's why I, co why I covered NEAT, so they basically use need to evolve uh, CPPNs such that we can produce very complex patterns with all of the necessary properties that um, showcase that this is a, indeed a good uh, model of development. And now we, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. So here is the experiments they've done. So uh, various people created these platforms. So you, on, on the left, you can see this Nelfi Neat platform. On the right, you can see this Sharp Neat uh, platform. And basically what you can see here is the following. So this is a phenotype. So basically this, this, this uh, chemical gradient map uh, that uh, was created by a CPPN in the background. So each of these images you can see are these 2D spatial signals, which we can interpret as, as I said, multiple times chemical gradients. And each of these are in the background created by a particular CPPN. And the same thing on the right. And so what you do here is using NEAT uh, and using people to uh, select the parents, um, we, can, we can evolve more complex and more complex uh, spatial signals. So what that means is the following, so as I said, and uh, this particular pattern is going to have a CPPN in the background. So it's going to be some CPPN number one. This is going to be CPPN number two. So if somebody, if a user takes these two and we uh, match the genes and we do the crossing and then we do all the mutations, etc., etc., we're going to end up with a novel CPPN, which means that in turn, we're going to end up with a novel pattern. And now because humans are in the loop here, they can select interesting patterns and thus 
uh, crossbreed interesting patterns to, to create even more complex patterns. And if you do that, you end up with various cool patterns. And let me show you some of those. Uh, by the way, uh, just a slight detail. So aside from X and Y, what they additionally uh, input is this signal D, which is just your, your, your distance from the center of your uh, domain here. Uh, and this could be uh, in theory, learn by the CPPN by just composing uh, some uh, some functions there. Uh, but like this makes it a bit easier. This is just a kind of a shortcut that biases the CPPN towards being, uh, I guess, radially symmetric. I think they mentioned it somewhere. So however, since D is radially symmetric, it does not automatically provide a bilaterally symmetric coordinate frame. Okay, so D is biasing the CPPN towards radial symmetry. Um, let's see some results. So you can see that um, people manage to uh, generate uh, symmetric patterns such as this one, uh, which is uh, a very important uh, finding because uh, as we saw with the fly example, when you have this bilateral symmetry pattern, then that means you can form bilater bilaterally symmetric uh, bodies. And this is the corresponding CPPN uh, that is generating this particular pattern. Um, they also showed that um, they can evolve quite intricate patterns. So you can see here, uh, the idea is to create a spaceship. And again, people were just playing, taking certain parents, certain CPPNs, cr across um, breeding them and mutating them. And we end up with this sequence. So this is, uh, these are like, uh, this is like maybe generation number one. And then uh, basically, uh, we are evolving with each generation, you have more and more intricate patterns. And you can see what happens is that uh, we're kind of uh, elaborating uh, on, on certain details, whereas this overarching pattern, this, this bilateral uh, symmetry uh, is preserved uh, throughout this whole sequence all the way to the end where we have these well, this looks more like manta ray than, than like a spaceship. Maybe this looks like an airplane. Um, but in all case, in any case, you can see that um, we can generate uh, very, very complex patterns uh, with all of the necessary properties uh, using CPPNs. Um, important uh, thing is to to be able to represent not just perfect symmetry, but also imperfect symmetry. Because for example, take human body as an example. So your heart is not perfectly symmetric. So your heart is moved a bit to the left uh, instead of being centrally positioned. So that's a very good example of imperfect symmetry um, in our bodies. So we wanna be able to um, represent that in, our, in, our, in these uh, signals. So here they show that um, uh, aside from having perfectly symmetric sunglasses uh, pattern that somebody produced, uh, we can have also this 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 uh, imperfect symmetry where you can see that uh, this part is uh, of different size compared to the to this left, uh, I guess, uh, part of the signal. So that's another important um, argument for the expressivity of these CPPNs. Uh, now. Again, repetition is something that's super important and repetition with variation uh, is also important. So similarly to how it's important to have imperfect symmetry and not just uh, perfect symmetry. So we will also wanna have some variations in the repetition, not just perfect uh, repetition. So here they show that if you input the, these additional, these special signals like sine, sine of 10x and sine of 10y and then the d, which is the distance from the center, if you input these signals, we generate uh, very complex patterns. And now you may think to yourself, now this is cheating because why would you input sinusoids instead of just uh, your regular uh, X and Y coordinates? And the thing is, uh, this is just kind of a convenience because CPPNs could in theory learn without any problem to combine because they do have signs uh, at their disposal when composing the, the CPPN itself. So they could learn the same thing. This is just for, for, for convenience. And you can see amazing patterns uh, popping up here. So here you can see uh, there is a lot of repetition obviously, but there is some variation as well. So if we were to zoom in into this region, then you get this one here and you can see that obviously the, this kernel here is, is different from, from this one here. And yeah, yeah, like bunch of images um, further testify that this is the case. Um, yeah, going forward, um, you can see that in some cases, 
that the CPPN learns to ignore those sinusoids and focuses more on the D signal, i.e. the distance from the center of the image, and then you end up with these uh, very intricate patterns which are much more radially symmetric compared to the previous ones. And they indeed they showcase that that's not like a cherry picked example. Uh, a lot of times the CPPNs end up with these um, signals that have all of these nice properties. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, they, they, they mentioned finally, this is an important sentence. So the importance of local interaction to developmental abstraction is an open question. They basically show that CPPNs are um, an interesting alternative to cellular automata or other models of developmental uh, biology. Now, I did briefly mention that even though they are using CPPNs as a, as a developmental model, they can also use it to just model uh, various neural network architectures. And let me show you how that could be done, like a simple interpretation of these spatial signals that are generated by, by, by CPPNs. So if, you, if I were to take this simple CPPN, let me just find the diagram, so this one here. Now let's imagine that instead of uh, feeding in uh, the signal uh, D, let's imagine we feed in X1, uh, Y1, and uh, X2, uh, Y2, and then we somehow learn CPPN so that the output, uh, this output scalar is has such prop like the similar properties to what we've seen in 2D uh, signals. Uh, so sim being symmetric, being uh, being repetitive, etc., etc. Now, if we were to constrain the, the the range of these signals to be from zero to one, this is basically a, a signal defined on a, on a 4D hypercube. And uh, what's now interesting is how you can interpret this. So you can interpret it the following way. So imagine we have a grid. Imagine we have a grid like this. And so let me just draw the, the, the vertical lines and the horizontal lines. And let's now imagine you input the coordinates. So this is x1, y1. And this is uh, x2, y2. And you plug in these numbers. So this is going to be, for example, 0, 0. This is going to be um, maybe 0. And this is going to be 0 0.2. Because like basically what I've done is I've normalized the, 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 the length of this grid to, to be. So this is where 0 is. This is 1. And similarly here. So we have uh, 0 being here and 1 being here. And then we just take the coordinates. And you get output. And you get some number as the output. And you can interpret that as a, as a, as a weight of the connection between these two cells. And that means you can now build uh, neural networks that have uh, symmetric connections, that have repetitive connections, etc., etc., by just finding appropriate CPPNs. So that's the whole idea be behind the hyper neat paper uh, that's a follow up work uh, after that came after this paper. So again, let's um, imagine this is maybe output 0.7 for these particular coordinates. So that means this is going to be of weight 0.7. And then you just start uh, tracing, you just do an extensive uh, search, you basically input all of the possible combinations here. And for example, you set a certain threshold. So if a certain weight is below, I don't know, like maybe 0.3, then there is no connection there. Otherwise, you have a connection with the given weight. And that's how you form uh, a neural network by using a CPPN. So why this is very cool is uh, because you can use a much smaller model. So this CPPN may have like hundreds or thousands of nodes and you may end up with like millions or even billions of, of connections in your in your neural networks. This is uh, like basically a low dimensional representation, uh, like the gist of your of your uh, phenotype, which is in this particular case, a neural network. Cool, hopefully you found some interesting ideas in these two papers. Uh, if you did, consider subscribing, uh, share the video out, and uh, join the Discord community as well. And until next time, bye-bye.